Okay, cheers. Um, so before I begin, Lacio and I, we wrote a quick sort of first draft of an example slash exercise sheet. Okay, so if people want to find it and do it over the weekend, then you're more than welcome. So Google for Alessio's homepage. That's pretty easy to find. And then once you're there, I think you go to the um, teaching section on his page, and it's just the first link on the teaching section. Okay. But it's um, just the first draft, like I said, and we'll be adding to it and correcting it and making it make sense over time. Okay. So today I want to tell you about just one thing, which is mutation, which Alessio alluded to yesterday. Um, so those of you who've seen it before are going to really hate this action. Okay. So I think there's probably two references that I should point out. So the first one is on the archive. Okay, so it's this paper in the archive. So this is by actor um, Coates and Galkin and myself. And then the second paper is also by Galkin and by Usnich. And this um, isn't on the archive. Instead, just Google for Galkin Usnich, and then it's got a preprint number, which is IPHU 10 OK, so you can find that. So the material in today's talk is sort of all in those two papers. OK. All right, so I think Alessio had got us to the stage where we were looking at um, Laurent polynomials. And he sort of passed to the Newton polytope. And he said, from this Newton polytope, we want to create a toric variety. So from here, we want to take xp, the toric variety, And this is given by the spanning fan of P. So in the sort of toric geometry world, this means that P lives in the lattice N. Okay. And so motivated by the fact that we want to turn these Newton polytopes or these polytopes into um, fans, they have to have some properties for it to make sense. So in particular, we need um, the origin to be in the strict interior of P, and we need the vertices of P to be primitive. And um, if we don't have those two conditions, then we can't turn it into a complete fan. So this is why we do that. That's all, the only reason why we do that. And it, these are called, for obvious reasons, Fano polytopes. And true vertex. Sorry? True vertex. I mean, how do you mean by? Right, no, I mean an actual corner. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah the number of variables can be anything. Okay. Yeah. All right, so from our point of view, <laughs> it's easy to make polytops, but it's not so easy to make good Laurent polynomials. And so what we want to do is find a sensible sort of ansatz, a sensible way of you give us a final polytop and we find a way of assigning coefficients to it so that it's a mirror for something. Okay. 
I mean, that's basically the moral of what we're trying to do. Um, so today I'm going to try and move us away from the world of Laurent polynomials and into the world of polytops. All right. But to begin with, I'm just going to recall the, the mirror for P2, which Alessio did in the very first lecture. So let's take F to be X plus Y plus 1 over XY. I should perhaps point out that in moving from a polytope back to a Laurent polynomial, there's a whole host of um, requirements that we're not really sure what they should be. So I think they were brought up before, like should the coefficients be integers? Are, um, you know, are they allowed to be negative? You know, we don't really know what we're doing just yet. But anyway, <laughs> what we got works, which is what I'm going to show you. All right. So we start with this Laurent polynomial. This has the period sequence, if you remember. And Alessio pointing out that you can easily take its Taylor expansion. And what you have is the um, coefficient of the constant term, of the constant term of successive powers of f. And in this particular case, you'll find that you only get values of k that are divisible by 3. And you have 3n factorial over n factorial to the 3. And here now we have n and t to the 3. N. OK, so this is what it looks like in just the first few terms. Uh, 1 plus 6t cubed plus 90. Yeah, I think so. 90t to the 6 plus dot, dot, dot. And if we move past to the Newton polytope, this is just going to be here's my origin. This is just going to be this polytope. Okay? And the associated type variety, we just take the fan that passes through the faces of the polytope. And so this is our fan. And those of you who've seen um, sorry, geometry before will probably recognize this. We have xp is just equal to p2. Okay. So what we're hoping for is that the um, torrent varieties constructed this way are um, degenerations, as Rachel said, of our final. And in this case, a torrent degeneration of p2 is just p2. It's good. OK. So the question is, are there any ways that we can modify our choice of Laurent polynomial but still get the exact same period sequence? Well, there's one obvious way. So um, I think pretty obviously, we can apply a monomial change of variables. And this won't change anything, because the constant term will be fixed. So. Okay, so just, I'm going to do it concretely in this case. I just apply this change of variables. Okay, then I'm going to get F prime, which is just 1 plus X over XY plus XY squared. OK, so that's not very interesting. And basically, we just regard polytopes and we regard Laurent polynomials as being the same up to the action of um, GL dz. OK. Um, now I'm going to apply a more interesting transformation to this. So I'm going to apply the transformation that's going to leave x unchanged. And it's going to multiply y by 1 plus x y. Okay. So doing this, I'm going to get g prime, which in this case is just going to be 
1 over x, y plus x, 1 plus x squared, y squared. So this is still a Laurent polynomial. I mean, it obviously didn't need to be a Laurent polynomial, but I rigged it up so it was still a Laurent polynomial. And it's harder to work out what the um, period sequence is for this, but if you go away and try it, you'll find that you get the same thing. Okay, so this is also just a mirror for P2. It just gives us exactly the same period sequence. And if I draw its Newton polytope, well, let me undo the change of basis first. So um, undoing the change of um, variables gives, um, so via, might as well be explicit since I got it written down. So x goes to x squared y, y goes to 1 over x. So what we're going to get is, is 1 over x, y plus 1 plus x squared y squared y. Okay. Fine. The obvious thing now, I guess, is to draw its Newton polytope and see what sort of toric varieties come out of this. Okay? So let's just have a crack at that. This is slightly more unwieldy than the last one. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, five, six. Okay, so what do we have? We have 1 over x squared, so I'll stick the origin here. And then if I go up to y, I need a line that goes across twice. So I have this. Okay. And if I draw the fan... I'm going to get this this and this. Okay, so it's still simplicial. Um, but just notice in here, this is no longer a smooth tone. This actually has a singularity, a quarter one, one. And so in this case, x of, um, let's call this q, this is just weighted projected space, p114. So this is an example of a mutation. So for us, mutations, well, we regard two things that are the same up to change of basis, monomial change of basis of being the same anyway. So for us, mutations are these birational transformations that pretty much look like what I've just written that preserve the period. So slightly more generally, and you know, sorry if you feel that you've already digested exactly what a mutation is, but they're so important to the whole of the rest of everything that we do, I think it's worth just spending our time on this. So slightly more generally, let's let us what I sell some Laurent polynomial in, you know, an arbitrary number of variables. But I'm just going to make the last variable distinguished, just for this case. And I'm going to award myself a second Laurent polynomial, but this one is going to be in just the first d minus 1 variables. Okay? And I'm going to define basically exactly the same map, so nothing's going to happen for the first d minus 1 variables, and then y is going to get sent to a x. Okay. So, 
Let's suppose that when I apply that, I do end up with a Laurent polynomial, because in general, of course, it's just rational. Okay. Then, um, now there's some details that I'm not going to go into, but basically, then applying the change of variables formula to the period integral, you'll see that essentially nothing, nothing changes, and we see that um, pi of f is just equal to pi of g. Okay. I mean, it pretty much is just change of variables. The problem is like the domain of integration, but let's not worry about it. All right, but um, of course, in general, this isn't Laurent. So what do we need to do to rig it up so that it is Laurent? Okay. So what um, do we need to assume? In order for G to be Laurent. rather than just rational, as it you know, typically would be. Well, I mean, again, there's literally no mystery about this whatsoever. I basically need to be able to divide my factors that make up G by this A, okay? So let's just write um, F is just equal to some sum. where I've um, basically graded by the final variable. So here we have the pi's of Laurent polynomials in d minus 1 variables, and only finitely many of the pi's are non-zero. And let's just suppose that there exists some um, ri in d minus 1 variables, okay, such that, now what is this? It should be that pi is equal to ri a to the minus i for all, or for each, i less than 0. Okay. So in that case, I can just write down what G is. So then G is just given by, well, the negative bits, so I from minus infinity to minus 1. And this A is going to go, and we're going to give ourselves an Ri. And then the positive bits. Just multiplying the yeah. so that's just all that it is. As I say there's no mystery about this. What we need to do. All right. So let's define what I mean by mutation. So definition. So let's just um, award ourselves a lattice of rank D. Let's swap it to Z to the D. Okay. And um, let's award ourselves a grading on this lattice. So we're going to let H be an element in the dual lattice. And it needs to be primitive. Okay. And so H induces grading. Okay. 
now we just going to award ourselves an A. So um, let's let A. And we want A to be in the zeroth piece of this grading. So I'm just going to be in H perp intersect. So this pair, H and A, is the data that defines a mutation. So it defines a map, or an automorphism, I suppose, from um, the rational functions to the rational functions. And um, what do we have? And we say, oh, I need to tell what the map is, sorry. Um, just given by some x is going to go to x to the a, a to the h of a. And here we have A is in. So we say that some Laurent polynomial F is mutable with respect to this data. If the image under this map is also a Laurent polynomial. So if um, G, which is just going to be this, is Laurent. Okay? And we just call G a mutation. And because um, it's just kind of nice to give it a name, we call A a factor. Right, so just a few little observations. Okay, so the first one, I guess, is if we just set A to be a monomial, okay, then actually this isn't very interesting. All we're doing is applying a monomial change of basis to um, F. So we kind of don't want to worry about cases like that. Okay. So we'll think of that as just a sort of trivial mutation. Okay. So just extending that, um, what I can do is I can just take my factor A and I can just multiply it by a monomial, and that's just going to give me the same mutation too. So um, H, A, and um, H, A times by X, B. Uh, give um, isomorphic mutations. Okay, so we try to only regard our factor A as being defined up to this translation. Sorry? Which? Yeah, which part from here? Oh, H, H A and H A times X to the power of B, just this. 
okay, give isomorphic mutations. Yeah, it's excellent. Wish I hadn't um, introduced underlines. Okay, so these just give isomorphic mutations. So, in other words, that's probably too long. So we think. of A as being defined only up to these translations, or these multiplications. And like I said, you know, we, we don't really worry about a uh, monomial change of basis. We just regard those Laurent polynomials as being the same. And so you can already state a nice little result. If you give me two Laurent polynomials that are connected via a sequence of mutations, then their period sequences agree. Okay. So um, So if F and G are the rounds and connected via a sequence of mutations, and plus change of basis. Okay, then um, they have the same period. And the question to which we don't know the answer is, is the converse true? So is this an if and only if? Any? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no. We've done ex we've done exactly that. Yeah, yeah. We've done exactly that. Yeah, and they've always been connected. Right? Yeah. Done like. Um, it's it's very common. So think about it this way, roughly speak, yeah, think about it, there's roughly speaking, there's 4,000 reflexive free topes, okay, and you can put um, a Laurent polynomial on them, and these will be, roughly speaking, mirrors to the 105 final manifolds, okay, so there's like a, what is that, a 40 to 1 <laughs> duplicity, <laughs> and you'll find that actually whenever you find two things that have the same period sequence made this way, then they are connected by a mutation. Never found a counterexample and have not always just done it in the naive way. <laughs> All right. All right. So I just, after sort of, oops. After going on about how we just regard two polynomials that are isomorphic under a change of basis as being the same, I now want to say that actually it's sometimes quite useful not to do that. Okay. So I'm going to start with, again, the mirror of P2. So x plus y plus 1 over x, y. And I'm going to mutate this in three completely different ways. Okay. So the first thing is I'm going to notice that I can write this as x of 1 plus y over x plus 1 over x, y. Okay. So this means that I can pick some mutation data as follows. I can pick um, my h to be minus 1 minus 1, and my factor a to just be 1 plus 
y over x. And if I apply that mutation, I'm just going to get x plus x plus y squared over x to the free y. So I can also write this as um, x times by 1 plus 1 over x squared y plus y. Okay. And now I could award myself the mutation data minus 1, 2 for my h and 1 plus 1 over x squared y for my a. And this is going to give me the Laurent polynomial x plus y times by 1 plus 1 over x squared y squared. Okay. And then the third way is I can write this as 1 over xy times by 1 plus xy squared plus x. Okay. And here I can just give myself my h to be minus whoops, to be 2 minus 1, and my factor to be 1 plus xy squared. Okay. And this is going to give me 1 over xy plus x, 1 plus xy squared, presumably squared. Yeah. Okay. So here I've got three sort of fundamentally different mutations coming out of the mirror for P2. But in fact, the three Laurent polynomials I get, they're the same under a change of basis. Okay. So, <laughs> yes, the point of this is, you know, sometimes you have to remember that you achieve the same polynomial in different ways. So, so all three mutations are isomorphic. But um, it pays to remember there are three different mutations. Okay. And here, I guess I should sort of just stick in a little reference to a paper by Paul and uh, Paul Hacking and Prokhorov. So on the archive, it's 08, 08, 1, 5, 5, 0. This is a beautiful example. It turns out you can keep mutating this and you get this beautiful trivalent graph of mutations and it has connections with like the Markov equation and all sorts of things. And so it's really described in some detail there. All right, so this is all at the level of Laurent polynomials, and I kind of said that we wanted to move away from Laurent polynomials because although it's easy to write Fano polygons or Fano polytopes, it's not easy to know how to pick the coefficients of them to turn them into Laurent polynomials. So let me basically just reinterpret all of this in terms of combinatorics of polytopes. So definition. So we just begin by fixing our lattice. Okay. And we're going to pick a primitive vector in the dual lattice. And we're going to award ourselves, this time, a convex lattice polytope A inside. So I'm just going to say inside H perp. Okay. Um, just to be clear about what I'm talking about there, I'm taking that to be all those points A in N tensored with R such that H of A is zero. Okay, so.
So pretty obviously, you know, A is of co-dimension at least one, and I'm not insisting that it's a Fano or anything like that. Okay. And now I'm gonna award myself what's basically my Newton polytope. So let's let P contained in N tensor R be a convex lattice polytope. Now, actually, it doesn't even need to be a polytope. We're going to work through this definition, and you'll see that this definition would apply even if it was a non-compact object. So this can be a polyhedra rather than a polytope. And I'm not even insisting that it's a final polytope, although typically, you know, this will be a final polytope. And then what I need to do is I need to just apply those conditions that we saw before for a Laurent polynomial that allowed it to be meetable. I need to apply those conditions to P. So in order to do that, I'm just going to have to take the slices given by the grading. So let's let PI be given by the convex hull of... Um, So I want it to be the convex hull of those points, the lattice points in P that are at height I. So, um, you know, only finitely many of these are non-empty. And then I need that little condition that I had for the Laurent polynomials that just allowed me to um, do the division and stay around. So phrased into combinatorics, it reads like this. Um, suppose that there exist these convex lattice polytopes um, Ri contained in HPERP. Okay, such that, so before it was um, multiplication, and of course here now it's going to be Minkowski sum. So such that this Minkowski sum is contained in PI, and on the other side, we also need it to contain the vertices of P at this height. Here I is negative. Okay. Okay. So once I've got that, um, then I can define a mutation. So the mutation So here, it requires knowledge of H and A. And it's just going to be given by, you know, this looks a bit ugly, but if you just think about what we did with the Laurent polynomials, it's completely natural. So I'm just going to, I'm going to remove these A's so I just get the remainders. And then the positive heights. I'm going to add on copies of my A's. So it's going to be P, well, let's call this a J. P, J, plus J. Okay. So this is exactly analogous to that formula we had before. I guess the only thing that's slightly different is... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, this is my next remark. Okay. 
But before I say that, um, you know, the only thing that's sort of obviously different is the fact that here we have to include the vertices. But that kind of makes sense because we're thinking of this as coming from a Newton polytope. And the Newton polytope has those vertices precisely because there's a non-zero coefficient there. And so it's important that we preserve the vertices when we do this. Okay, so that's why the vertices appear. Okay, so a little remark. Um, so although these RIs, these remainders, have to exist for the mutation to exist, in fact, the particular choice of them, it turns out, doesn't change what the mutation is. Okay, so I'll say that. So the mutation does not depend on the choice. Okay, I'm not going to prove that at all, but it's essentially due to the convexity of this thing. Because we're taking a convex body, different choices of the R's, they just get subsumed into a convex hull, so it really doesn't make any difference. Um, they are in HP. Yeah, you're completely right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so you're right, of course, that these little RIs, they just correspond to the different remainders that you could have got with all the different... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, I don't know if I have time today, but I'll show you the dual picture. And in the dual picture, basically, you know, the R's don't even feature, and it's completely canonical. All right. So my remarks basically just mirror what we said before. Um, if R is just the point, then, um, oops, not R, I'm calling it A. If A is just the point, then um, the mutation of P is just isomorphic to P. So we regard that as trivial. And um, we also have um, that if I translate my factor, so by any element A, Then again, it's just isomorphic. So factors, these, these A's are really only defined up to translation. And that's kind of useful, because it's often handy just to insist that the origin is one of the um, the vertices of your A. Okay. And then, obviously, <laughs> now we have a slight notational nightmare. Um, suppose um, we have that F and G are the ramp polynomials with um, G equal to the mutation with respect to No, only if, um, only if A is of code dimension one. Yeah. So if A is code dimension one. Mm. 
Well, there's two H's, but yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, that's true. Except, you know, here I'm taking the slices through P as determined by the gradient H. So, I mean, it definitely appears in every single one of these choices. Also, you know, just flipping the sign of H, I mean, that's not something you could do arbitrarily. It really matters which sign of H you use. So even if it's equal to code I mentioned one, you still have a slide. But you know, the, the choice of grading really does um, matter in these slices that you're taking. Okay, anyway, the point of this is, you know, if I just do a mutation of Laurent polynomials and I mute the Newton polytopes, I get a mutation of um, polytopes. Um, what do I need to say? I just need to say that the Newton of G is equal to the mutation with respect to H and the Newton of A. Okay, but the converse isn't true. So what I mean by that is if you've already fixed your F and your G and you find a mutation of the Newton polytopes, it doesn't mean that you can mutate your F and your G. Okay, the particular choices of coefficients really do come into play into all of this. But um, you can always pick some coefficients on your polytopes so that it lifts to a mutation of the Laurent polynomials. That's not a problem. And, you know, that's um, going to be important in the rest of the stuff we did. Okay. What do I want to say next? Yeah, and then one final remark. Um, again, I, well, maybe I can sort of sketch a proof to you. Um, so let's let Q be a mutation of P. Then we have Q is final if and only if P is final. So let me just sketch in words why that's likely to be true. Yeah, yeah, okay, so maybe I should point out that. Yeah, you can always invert mutation by flipping the sign of H. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, why is it that P and P, P, you know, Q is um, final if P is final. So, well, I mean, the first thing is that P has the origin strictly in its interior at size zero. So you see from this definition that for sure Q is also going to have the origin strictly in its interior. That's all right. The real question is why are the vertices of Q primitive? Okay, so the vertices of P are primitive. Why are the vertices of Q primitive? And the answer is... Maybe I regret having said this. Okay. If we look at our Q, and I just look at a vertex of Q. So here's some vertex of Q. Okay. Um, where does it come from? Well, it's come from the Minkowski sum of, I mean, this is a sketch. So it's come from basically the Minkowski sum of um, a vertex of V and a vertex of A. So this um, vertex, let's call it A. No, let's not call it A, let's call it V. So we have V is equal to A plus U for some A, a vertex of A, and B, a vertex of P. 
Okay. Now, if v, oh, whoops, u, a vertex of p. Now, if u wasn't primitive, then there'd be, of course, some other point down here heading towards the origin um, inside the polytope. Okay. And that point, I could be written as, um, I suppose, it's going to be. Um, okay. It's going to be more precisely. It's going to be h u. Plus a. Okay. Now, if I look at this point here, this point is given by um, its height. Yeah, I know, I know. That's what I wanted to say. Is it really too small? Yep, okay. I'll just write that one bit bigger. Okay. The point is that if it was divisible, then I could just divide this, and I'd get a point that was inside my interior. So if V was divisible, then I'd have, um, let's see, how do I say this? I'd have U minus, well, then I'd have u is divisible, which is another out. So, I mean, this is only meant to be a sketch, but. Okay. So, this is kind of important for us in the sense that once we're in the category of Fano polygon polytopes, we never leave the category of Fano polytopes when we do mutation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, um, okay, I guess what Alessia was saying is um, if we have our two panels that are rising under mutation, or, well, that's kind of tautological now. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess the point is that we want mutation to give us a deformation from this fano. Okay, QG deformation. And so if it was possible for mutation to land you in something that wasn't a final polytope, we'd obviously have problems. Okay. So you know, the fact that this is true is sort of a good hint that these two um, toric varieties are deformation equivalent. So Alessio's point is that mutation, so if we have Q is equal to the mutation of P, okay, then we, um, we believe, well, believe, prove, Nathan proves it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, we have, I guess, by paper of Nathan Elton. And I guess it's in 2012. Okay. We have um, that the two toric varieties, XP and XQ, are uh, deformation equivalent. You know, if this wasn't true, um, that would be a ludicrous thing to believe. 
All right, I just want to wrap up with one final example. I'm just going to do P2 again. I'm going to do P2. at the level of the polytopes. So I'm going to start with P and Q Gorenstein. Q Gorenstein. So Q Gorenstein. Yeah. And Q was in, you know, the rationals. But, I mean, what is it, Horatio? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand that either. All right, so I'm going to pick this mutation data. So, of course, this imposes a grading. So, what the heck? Let me draw it. Okay, so this is the grading imposed by H. So, stuff down here is at height minus one, this is at height zero, this is at height one, and this is at height two. And then you know, these rules basically say that I have to subtract off appropriate copies, Minkowski subtract, whatever that means, appropriate copies of A at negative heights, and then at positive heights, I just need to add on Minkowski copies of A. Okay. So if I do that, well, it's that big example we've already seen. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. All right, let me just draw the um, grading back on this, just because it helps. One. So the origin is here. So down here, I subtract off one copy of this A, so I end up with just the point. And then as I work my way up, well, up at the very top, I need to add on two copies of the A, because it's at height two. So I end up all the way out over here. Okay. And then the whole thing, it's sufficient for me to just sort of take the shortcut. But uh, you know, this is what's happening. So as we move up through the grading, we're removing copies, and then we're adding on copies, and you get this. Okay, so this just gives me a map from B2 to um, B114. All right, so you now stop there and do some higher ex dimensional examples next.